Monsieur le Président, Secrétaire Général, Mesdames, Messieurs, I'm very honored to be here, and uh, I'm just a small professor from Germany. I don't do uh, much uh, advice to governments and so on. I just listen to my own investment portfolio and that of my investors. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Atu, for your presentation. Um, I can build right on it because I share your views in 90% or 95. Maybe this is an example of uh, French-German cooperation. <laughs> now, let me see. I keep it short because you made first the first part of my presentation. Which European debt crisis, really? The, this crisis started in 97 and it originated in the United States. And if you look at the macroeconomic figures, it's really a US crisis. Europe macroeconomically as an area is much, much sounder than either the United States or Japan, really. I mean, if you have a public deficit in the whole area of about 40% of the US deficit, if you have a debt level of less than 50% of the Japanese debt level, it's quite amazing that we talk about Euro Europeans' debt crisis and European governments let themselves be driven by a debt crisis um, for two years now. And I recommended uh, as early as uh, March, April 2010 to just let Greece out of the Eurozone. I know I'm making some friends, some enemies with that, and the debt crisis would be over in some ways. Of course, we would have had to find ways to recapitalize the banks. We would have had to find ways to assist Greece from within the European Union, but that would have solved quite a few problems. I'm coming back to that later. The sovereign debt right now, the sovereign debt crisis is a direct consequence of private sector excesses. And it's only a sovereign debt crisis because A, we lower taxes all over the world and B, because the public sector is picking up the bill for the private sector, especially the financial sector. I mean, it's as simple as that. And so if we want to solve that crisis, we just need the political will, as the Poli Secretary General pointed out. Um, and um, the public debt really has taken off in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, as a consequence of the financial crisis. And of course, Rogoff and Reinhardt in their book on four centuries of financial crisis point out that once it surpasses 80% of GDP in the past 400 years, which they studied, we, we get serious problems because the uh, debt is... Uh, um, actually uh, really a detriment to growth and to economic development. The euro, yes, it has a great idea, but it's also a problematic idea. It helped international companies, of course, form a unified market. It established the euro as a reserve currency in the world from 17% of world reserves 10 years ago. We're now at 27 and 27 is a significant chunk. And if you, if you realize that the US needs the reserve status of the dollar to finance its external deficit, then the euro is a threat to the dollar to some extent. It's as simple as that again. So the euro in some sense is viewed across the Atlantic with, let's say, suspicion. When I got my first job as a professor at Boston University, in 1998, in April, my first lecture in which I applied for the job was the euro and the future of the European Monetary Union. I argued that the euro at that point was not really a well-conceived idea because we unified the currency, but we didn't unify fiscal policy and the economy. And Europe was not ready for the euro, was my argument, and I predicted severe problems within 10 years. Well, it took about 11, but let's put this within the margin of error. Uh, in America, this was liked. I got the job. When I tried to publish it in Germany, I had no success. So you, so you can find the lecture now at the American Council of Germany, when, on Germany. If you uh, ask them, they will gladly send you a copy. But really, has the euro unified Europe politically? I doubt it. Maybe now, maybe now. But so far, it has created some discord, some debate, some political fight. 
Is it very democratic? Not really. And it also helped foster the, the bubbles that we're now fighting. The real estate bubble in Spain, the consumption bubble in Greece, the um, investment bubble, the unsound investment bubble in Ireland. And if you look at the uh, spreads, they were roughly the same before we introduced the euro as they are now. So it's, in some ways, we're back to normal. And in between, we were, let's say, blinded by the illusion of economic unity. Economic unity still is some way off. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, and so we're just seeing, in some ways, a normal development. Plus, uh, if you think about the rating agencies, I'm sure I'm making some more enemies here, it's a cartel, of course. And we've had some, some advances by the European Commission, and it's always pro-cyclical. It rates afterwards, which is no uh, surprise. It's a bureauc the bureaucracies. They act according to procedure and so on. I mean, fairly, but uh, pro-cyclically, after the fact, normally. And there's also elements of a planned, administered economy in there. This is not a market economy. This is power projection. I mean, if one says, well, we put some numbers on something, and then we need less equity, less capital for AAA bonds or for subprime or whatever, that's planned economy. I mean, that job should be done by financial institutions themselves, I would say. But that's, of course, is far off. We're in a different reality. I'm just uh, provoking with some thoughts here. And maybe, just maybe, the opinions are not too favorable to continental Europe. Um, if you think about the fact that S&P's CEO left the company quite suddenly three weeks after the agency rated down US debt, one starts thinking at least. Um, and if you think about really the US with uh, deficit over 10%, high unemployment, real estate sector in trouble, then one thinks really what's going on here. I have to skip a few. Okay, negative outlook. Luigi, take some of your men, bring, them, bring Standard & Poor's to the cliffs, show them what a negative outlook looks like. Okay, Don Corleone. We basically have four principal debt reduction options. We can go into innovation and growth, but this will not be enough. Of course, reindustrialization of the United States was low, ex uh, was low, um, um, or was uh, low wages and so on is one way to go. But it could also be bubbles, as you pointed out. There could be inflation. I think we need inflation to combat this crisis. We won't go without. We could def have defaults, haircuts and we can have economic reform. And I also think we need haircuts in Europe, urgently, with Greece 50, 60% on all debt, not just on the debt held by banks. So they needed, I would say, a haircut by 200 billion. And the future in this situation is binary, deflation or inflation. We're in a very, very small path towards the future, and it could go either way. I hope, I hope we'll choose the inflationary scenario, but uh, I'm not quite sure we will succeed. In the end, Hans Werner Sinn, one of our most respected economists in Germany, calls this a giant asset poker. Um, it's Europe, North versus South, it's the financial sector versus households and industrial sector, it's the US versus Europe, um, and the stock prices in Europe are very depressed. Uh, Southern Europe even more, and private equity firms and M&A firms are already salivating over potential deals in uh, this year because the asset prices are so low in Europe. Well, let's go to the end. Uh, last summer I wrote uh, an editorial in one of our largest magazines. It says uh, France and Germany have to stand together, go one step further. Since then, much has happened, even more has to happen. Of course, this can only be the core of a European agreement, and of course it has to be within the Eurozone, because, uh, I say this frankly, if we wait for London, it will never happen. 
And the solution could be first or only for the Eurozone. I would think, I don't think this is very likely, but this would be my solution. Greeks should go out of the Eurozone. Spain, Portugal, Ireland too, as Greek must, the others should consider. Plus massive haircut, plus um, European assistance and credit to those countries. I mean, we can't stop re refinancing those countries, but uh, we need the haircut. And in my point of view, it would be easier to facilitate if Greece left, took a vacation from the Europe for a few years and then returned. Basel II and III, of course, are highly problematic. They're really um, against credit granting institutions and for capital market-based market -based institutions. And so they're basically, um, let's say, regulations assisting capital market-oriented economies and hindering credit-oriented economies, which basically the German economy was, the Austrian, the Swiss, the French. Uh, and so it's also a political element behind this. I would go for a European rating agency, a state agency, if it costs 200 million, so what a year? I mean, the potential damage of being dependent on the Anglo-Saxon cartel is much higher. The FSF should be able to recapitalize banks, and we do need, and that's where the President de République and Madame Merkel are still uh, discussing, we also need bankruptcy procedures for financial sector institutions, and once again, I think uh, if France and Germany can hammer out an agreement, we have a good chance of solving this crisis. Thank you very much.